Good evening, folks. I don't know about you, but we had a real interesting night last night or yesterday afternoon. Uh, both ends of our road were blocked with huge trees that were that blew over, and uh, we the temptation was just to cut a hole through it so we could leave, but the county fine came and took care of things. Hope things were well at your place. Welcome to Prophecy of Hope uh, here and the folks on on. Uh, on, on the live stream, we'd like to welcome everybody. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the cleansing flood, but I want to make an announcement about tomorrow. Tomorrow morning at 9.30, there's going to be a session on living fully at 9.40, starting at 9.40. And then at 11 o'clock, there'll be another session. It's a thousand years in the reign of Christ. Y you've heard of the millennium before. That's what this is about, and it's really, really interesting. And both of those have come out of Daniel and Revelation. They're kind of mixed mixed together. Well, welcome here, and we'll just have Pastor Sandvik take over. Well, thank you, uh, Pastor Drew, for giving us our introduction. Welcome, everybody, and I hope you had a nice couple days, and... Uh, yeah, thank you for inviting everybody. We wanna we're we're doing just a couple things during our church time and, and Sabbath school time. We're inviting people to come say it's kind of like a little bit a little bit different uh, than a normal than a normal day, but we're kind of using it for the seminar. So if you're interested in those, we definitely want you there, and uh, love to have you come and join us there. And there is a there's a meal afterwards that we're doing a little fellowship meal. So. You're welcome to come to that too. I uh, I hope you uh, I hope you had a nice Wednesday and Thursday, and uh, hopefully your your plants didn't snap off with that wind that came down. Uh, I went and checked out my garden, and those little uh, tomato plants were kind of offended by the wind, but they survived. So <laughs> uh, anyway, it was all good. Well, as always, we want to approach Scripture. Uh, prayerfully, and we want to, uh, well, let's just read the anchor text. It's been a, been a couple days. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, it reminds us of how we approach the Word of God. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And we know what it says, but we'll read it anyway. It's good to read out of the Word. It says, these things we also, also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We got, we're getting, we got this about memorized now, but it goes on to say, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And... Uh, I don't want the things of God to be foolishness to me. I want them to be spiritually discerned in my life personally, and I pray that for yours. So I just want to invite each one of us uh, today to just bow our heads uh, for a word of prayer. And I invite you along with me in a moment of silent prayer to just invite God's Spirit to talk to your heart and to touch your heart. And we'll go, and then I'll have a little out loud prayer. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, I want to pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit in a mighty and powerful way. Not for, not for my sake, but for your sake and for your glory, Lord Jesus. For you are honored when we understand the things that you have given us, Lord. And I, I pray, Lord, that you would give us understanding today, Lord, as we open up your word. I pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Take me, Lord, the humble vessel. Hide me behind your cross, Lord. 
I want to see you lifted up and you glorified. This is my prayer in the precious name of Jesus. We thank you and praise you. Amen. Young man, he was a, must have been a freshman or sophomore in high school. He, maybe he was even a junior. I think he was actually a junior. It doesn't really matter. He came up to me and he was really, I mean, he was ready to give up his faith. And I don't have a glory story. I'm not going to tell you a story of where I said just the right thing. And then all of a sudden he said, all right, I'm back in. No, no, no. It's not one of those kind of stories. But what's interesting, he's talking about, I'm trying to figure out why, you know, this kid was like on fire for God. Like, why is he all of a sudden over here ready to give it all up? And, I mean, the kid's super smart and he knows all the arguments for why. And he's like ready to give up his faith. I'm thinking, what in the world's going on? Come to find out, he read about the Crusades. And he says, how can God really be who he says he is, a God of love, and have Christians out there doing these Crusades? You see, he misunderstood that the Christians doing the Crusades were not acting in the will of God. And so he was ascribing the evil that they were doing to the God of heaven, saying, this must be what God is like. Therefore... I don't want anything to do with it. It's interesting. When, when, when we have a false perception of something, it can really taint our reality. It can really darken our perception of, of whatever. You know what I'm saying? It can, it can darken our perception of who God is. Well, if God is doing this, how can God say he's a God of love? If God is doing this, how can he say he's fair? Well, maybe if we, if we understood correctly what God is actually doing and what he's actually like, all of a sudden we see things in a brand new light. Today, we're, we're, we're talking about the, the cleansing flood. Well, it's just one of the things we're talking about today. We're, we're looking at um, kind of picking up where we left off. We're, we're looking at the wine of Babylon to some extent. And then we're looking at the truth of what God's word said. Well, what was the wine of Babylon? Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But we're going to see some of the false doctrines that are out there in the world that are distorting the picture of God. And we're going to say, okay, what does the Bible actually say about this? And, and that's where we're going with it today. And what's interesting is I think we'll see God glorified and we'll see God lifted up in a mighty and powerful way. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and look at what we're going to learn today. What should we learn today? Well, number one, there, there are many false teachings in the world. And by the way, we're, we're not going to try to set them all straight. <laughs> there's, there's just way too many. But the truth sets people free. Number two, we should see that we need Christ in our lives through the Holy Spirit. Number three, today is the day of salvation. It's today. And number four, we're, we're going to look, oops, that Bible baptism, one of the things we'll talk about is by immersion. It is a symbol of a new life in Christ. These are things that we should see in today's presentation. So let's pull out our study guides and we'll dive right into it and go from there. Question number one, what does Revelation, now this is review from our study on Mystery Babylon, uh, what does Revelation say that the harlot makes the whole world drunk with? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 17 and we'll read verse 2 together, page number 1680, Revelation 17 and verse 2. And maybe we should read verse 1 so we have a little bit more context, just to remind ourselves. It's been a couple of days. Then one of the seven angels, this is verse 1, who had the seven bowls, came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with what? With the wine of her fornication. Interesting. The world is made drunk with the wine of the, fornic of the fornication of the harlot. And we saw what that was about. Um, last time, 
this, this, this church that is not walking according to the Bible, but is walking according to their own dictates. And what does that wine represent? Well, that wine, of course, represents false doctrine, false teachings. The world is getting a distorted picture of who God is. It's getting a distorted picture of what God has planned for their life. I wonder when Jesus comes again, how many will look and say, if only I had known I would have made different choices. If only I had known the truth about this, I would have, I would have made a different choice than I made. I would, have, I would have chosen Jesus. I didn't realize he was actually good. <laughs> These kinds of things. Well, let's continue on. So a little background. Why is truth so important? Why is truth so important? Let's turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and verse 32. Very famous statement by Jesus. In fact, this is one of those statements where a lot of people will quote it and not even realize they're quoting the Bible. They think that's, it's just, it's so commonly spoken at times that, that people think it's actually just a phrase out there and they don't realize it's actually from the Bible. John 8 and verse 32, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he goes on to say in verse 32, he says, and you shall know the what? The truth. And the truth shall make you free or set you free. The truth shall make you free. Why is the truth so important? Do you want to be free, friends? I mean, is that, is that what we want? we want? We want freedom from stress. We want freedom from sin. We want freedom from the things of this world. The Bible says the truth shall make you free. Anyone experienced the truth as it is in Jesus making a change in your life for the better? I don't ever want to go back. <laughs> I don't ever want to go back. Why is the truth so important? So what does the Bible define truth as? Now, John is a fascinating book. Probably, my, probably if I was to... I know we're not supposed to have favorite books of the Bible, but if I was going to have... Well, I don't know if we're not supposed to. But if, we were, if, we were gonna have a, if I was going to have a favorite book, it's probably got to be John. I love the book of John. It just paints the picture of who Jesus is so clearly. And in John chapter 14 and 17, we see some interesting statements about, about the truth as it is in Jesus. Let's go ahead and read them. John 14 and verse 6. Jesus says to Thomas and the rest of the disciples, Jesus said to him, I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So right off the bat here, Jesus defines himself as the truth. Well, in the same chapter, skip down to verse 17. Notice what else he defines or, or calls the truth. I'll start in verse 16 for the context. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper or comforter. The spirit of what? The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. What a promise. What else is the truth? Well, this, the Bible says the spirit, the Holy Spirit is truth. Now, does that make sense? I mean, it makes sense. I mean, the Holy Spirit and Jesus are one, right? So they, they better be on the same page, right? They're both on the truth page. Praise the Lord for that. Now skip over to John 17, and let's notice what Jesus says in his prayer regarding his disciples. Regarding his disciples. He says something really interesting in verse... Uh, John chapter 17 and verse 17. So he's praying to the Father and he says, Sanctify them by your what? By your truth. And then he says, Your word is truth. Interesting. Let's go one more verse as that the Bible defines as truth. Psalm chapter 119. Psalm 119 and verse 42. Psalm 119, verse 42. 
Oh, that's a typo. That should be a 142. Let's fix that. 142. I think it says it right on the study guide, though. All right, we got it right on the study guide. It should be 142. Verse 142. Psalm 119, 142. It goes on to say, Your righteousness is a what kind of righteousness? Everlasting righteousness. And then he says, Your law is truth. Interesting. Your law is truth. What does the Bible dis- define truth as? We says, number one, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. And then it says the Holy Spirit. It calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. And then we find, see, God's word is truth. And then we see the law is truth. Now, is it, let me ask you a question. What's the common factor with everything? God, right? God is truth. And God cannot lie. So it should be no surprise that these things are all defined as truth. But here we see the Bible defining truth, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God's Word, the law. And we, can, we could extrapolate from that. Obviously, the Father, we, we could extrapolate into that, the Father, because Jesus says, hey, whatever the Father has given me is what I've given to you. So obviously, the Father is truth. You know, if A is B and B is C, then A is also C, right? And so we can go from there and, and see what truth is. Now, why is that important? Because in great contrast, who is the father of deception? Let's go back to John. John chapter 8 and verse 44. Page 1394. John 8 and verse 44. And he says, Jesus is speaking, and he says, you are of, talking to, um, talking to these people that are listening, he says, you are of your father, the who? The devil. I'd I'd never want to hear those words spoken. (laughs) Mercy. You are of your father, of the devil, and the desires of your father, you want to do. Now, what is, what is this, what does the father, the devil, want to do? He was a what? Murderer from the beginning. And does not stand where? In the truth. Because there is how much truth in him? A little bit? There is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. Who is the father of deception? The devil. And I chose to use a happy picture of him. Because when the, when the devil lies, he doesn't come and try to make himself look like a little red-horned devil with pitchfork, does he? He transforms himself, the Bible says, into an angel of what? Light. And so, I mean, if we, if we saw him coming come in full force in the evil perspective, we would say, no way, no how, no, you know, goodbye, see ya. But no, 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 he comes in a subtle way trying to, trying to get us off track, doesn't he? The father of deception, the devil. What is the devil trying to do through false doctrine? And we could just say in general, what is the devil trying to do? But he knows if he can get you to buy into false doctrine, then it's going to cause some people, more people to be lost. When we don't see the picture of Jesus as clearly. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Let's turn there. We know this passage probably. And uh, Peter is talking here in the last chapter of the first epistle of Peter. And he says in verse 8, Be sober, be what? Vigilant. Why? Because your adversary who? The devil walks about like a roaring lion. And is he... Doing it for nice reasons because he wants to win the football game over at UNA. No. He, he's doing it because he's seeking it whom he may what? Devour. Now, he, does he care how he gets you off track? He doesn't care how he gets any of us off track. He just wants to get us off track, right? He wants to get us off track. Well, what does Jude say? Let's go to Jude, second to last book of the Bible. 1 verses 3 and 4. Notice what it says. Jude, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Jude writes, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, 
I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the what? For the faith which was once for all delivered to who? To the saints. So what Jude is saying is already in the time of Jude, people are leaving the apostolic purity of the, that, that, that of the teachings of Jesus. They're, they're getting off track just a little bit. He's like, wait a minute. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget what Jesus has said before us. Don't forget what we're basing our truth on. And he goes on in verse 4 to say, For certain men have crept in what? Unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into what? Lewdness. And deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So these we would call sons of who? The, the devil, right? The father's the father. The devil's the father of lies. And so here he has his little agents, people that are doing his biddings in the church, getting people deceived. Now notice this. The devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We saw that in First Peter. And we see that the devil, through his different agencies, his little minions, the little demons that are with him, and, and, and people that have purposefully or unknowingly bought into his, his ideas, they, they, turn from the grace, they turn the grace of God into lewdness and cause God to be what? Denied. In other words, false doctrine causes the character of God to be misrepresented. The character of God to be misrepresented. Now, let's just consider that for a moment. There is a, there is a, a doctrine that Revelation speaks, against, speaks out against um, in the first couple chapters of, of Revelation. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Well, what was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? They said, well, we cannot, we, we've gotten past the point where we cannot sin. It was a holy flesh movement. And so here they say we cannot sin and they end up totally disregarding all the precepts of the scriptures. They end up sharing wives. They end up doing all this crazy stuff. And this, this, this little thing ends up popping up over and over throughout Christian history. It happened in the 19th century. It happened in the 17th century. I mean, it happened in the 16th century. It's happened in the 20th century. People say, hey, God has changed our hearts. Therefore, we cannot sin anymore. Therefore, no matter what we do is not sin. And it totally reverses the Bible up, and up on its head. Now, this is a really interesting one. Now, let's say that one of these people who's claiming to be a Christian now comes and stands before um, your family member that has never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And this is their, this is their introduction now to Christianity. What kind of picture of God are they getting? A pretty sick, twisted one. A perverted one. A twisted one. And the doctrine is misrepresenting the character of God. It's totally flipped over on its head, God's character. Now, let's ask the question, question, how is God's character described? Let's turn to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, and let's make no mistake about it. 1 John 4 verse 8. If I was to say, what is the first pillar we need to build every doctrine upon? I would say 1 John 4 verse 8 is that pillar. What does it say? It says, he who does not what? Love does not what? Know God. Now that's a very serious thing. Do we want to know God? Do we know God? He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. In other words, the very essence of his being is love. This is what sets apart Christianity from all the other religions of the world. There's other religions that say their God is powerful. There's other religions that say their God works in people's lives. What other religion says that God is love? Not, not perverted love, not twisted love, but, but true love. I can think of none. God is love. The character of God. So with that in mind... Let's go ahead and let's look at three different doctrines that have been 
attacked by the devil, if you will. The wine of Babylon, so to speak. And we'll look at some other ones uh, coming forward. But the first one we want to look at is the doctrine of transubstantiation. How many of you are familiar with transubstantiation? Okay. Maybe you've never even heard that term before. This was actually one of the key issues in the Reformation at the beginning, was this doctrine. You'll recognize it when we get into it a little bit. What is the doctrine of transubstantiation? What does, it te- what does this teach us about Jesus being in our, well, I should say life, life. Jesus being our life. Well, in the Mass, in the Roman Catholic Church, if I go to a Mass, they're going to take the host. I don't know if you can see the little round wafer there. They're going to take the host and they're going to say the following words, hoc est, hoc est uh, corpus uh, meum. Anybody heard that phrase before? Or sometimes there's, a, there's another way that they'll say it. Um, ho- yeah, it means it translates the body. This is the body of Christ. They'll say it also, hoc est um, enum uh, meum, cor- or corpus meum. It means this is the body of Christ. If I said it really fast, hoc est corpus they, we get the phrase hocus pocus, right, from that, from that phrase, where the, the transubstantiation of the wafer becomes transformed into the actual, the literal body of Christ. So one of the things that was protested early on in Protestantism in the Reformation, they said, wait a minute, when Christ said, this is my body, he's talking in symbolic terms, not literal terms. He's not recreating his dead body in the bread, and he's not turning the, 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 the wine, the grape juice, into the actual literal blood of Christ. And so transubstantiation is the doctrine of the change of the bread and the wine into the literal body and blood of Christ. So what does this teach us about Jesus being in our lives? Well, Christ, that is God, can be mystically created. You could even say recreated in the Mass. Every time the Mass happens, Christ is being created all over again. Not alive, but dead. And then through the literal physical substance now of Jesus' body and Jesus' blood, we have Jesus in our lives in physical substance physical substance. So Christ now, the way, the way you get Christ in you is not by his, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's, conti- let's continue on. We'll, I'll, I'll, we'll jump back into that, that statement just a second here. Let's look at the Bible first. So this is the question that I was just about to say. How does the Bible teach that Christ can be actually in us? Is it by ingesting his literal body and blood? Well, let's, let's go back to John 14, 17. We just looked at that. But how do we have Christ? How do we have Christ in us? John fourteen seventeen, we just read that a minute ago. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be what, in you. Notice verse twenty six. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, in whose name? My name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that who? Who's the I? Jesus said to you. So it's the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, we have Christ dwelling in us. Notice it goes on to say the same thing in John 15. Just flip flip to the next chapter here. John 15, verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send from the Father, the Spirit of what? Truth, who proceeds from the Father, who is he going to testify of? Jesus Christ. He will testify of me, Jesus says. And then notice John 16, 13, and 14. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on whose authority? His own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Now, who is he hearing from? He will glorify who? Verse 14, me, Jesus, for he will take of what is mine, that's Jesus again, and declare it to you. So how do we have 
how do we have Christ live in us and dwell in us? According to the scriptures, through the Holy Spirit. It's not through the, the literal dead body of Christ and the literal blood of Jesus. Interesting. <clears throat> now let's continue on here just a little bit. What did Jesus say believers need to eat and drink? Now this is where, this is where our, our, our friends in, in the Roman Catholic faith get this idea um, this idea in some, in some part from. It's interesting when Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood, they take that as literal. It's also interesting to me when, when Jesus is going to say something, you're going to see what Jesus is going to say in just a minute here about that that's going to show that he's clearly talking in symbolic language. But they also go to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and they take that not literal when the Bible clearly teaches that it's literal. So they take the thing the Bible clear, clearly teaches literal, and they flip it up at his head, head, and they say, nope, these things aren't literal. And then they take the things that the Bible teaches symbolic, and they flip it on its head and say, nope, this is literal. Now, why, why, would, why would they come up with this idea? Let's notice what John chapter 6, verses 48 through 58 says. Page 1389. Jesus is, has just done the feeding of the 5,000, and he's talking about bread. And just, I, I just jumped in the middle of it to save a little time. He says in verse 48, I am the what? The bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are what? Dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. And then he says, I am the what? The living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live for how long? Forever. Praise the Lord. And the bread that I shall give is what? My flesh, which I shall give for the what? Life of the world. Hallelujah. There's, he's talking. He's pointing to the cross, right? Verse 52. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves. They take him. They, they believe at this point he's talking literal. So notice what they say. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now Jesus... I don't want to say he added fuel to the fire, but in a sense, it almost seems like it. Notice verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the what? The flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no what? Life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at when? The last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Now, if we stopped right there, we could, we could say, like, boy, this is, this is tough. And in several people, notice... Verse 61, just really quick, when Jesus, uh, no, verse 60, therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? I mean, it seems fairly understandable, but notice what Jesus says next. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? Verse 62, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? Now notice what he says in verse 63. He explains what he's saying. It is the what? The spirit who gives life. The flesh how, profits how much? Nothing. The flesh does not actually profit anything. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that we need, if we really need, if we're really going to abide with him, the life and death and resurrection of Christ needs to be so inter in, intertwined in our life that it's a part of us. It, he needs to dwell in our hearts. He needs to dwell in our minds so that we can have our lives transformed by the power of Jesus. Because how much can we really do on our own spiritually? Nothing, right? So we see where Jesus is going with this. But, but here Jesus said to the believers, you need to eat, eat and drink my flesh and blood. And they're like, wow, this is a hard saying. So how did Jesus convey the, the, convey the idea that he was talking in symbolic terms? We just read this. He says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. 
spirit and life. He's talking in symbolic language. He's talking in spiritual language because spiritual things are spiritually discerned, right? He's saying, I, you need to have me be a part of your life completely, filled all the way. Now notice our next question here. So what is the lesson Jesus is trying to teach us? Verse 57, he, had, he said it, he said it. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. If we're going to truly live, not just live this first time, but live forever because of Jesus, we need, I mean, what, why do we eat? What's the point of eating? So we stay alive. What, we eat, we grind up the, the little food particles, right? They're, they get broken down by the enzymes, by the stomach acid, by the different things, and then they get absorbed in the little parts and they become literally the building blocks of our life. Jesus is saying, my life needs to be the building blocks of your life. You need to, you need to, you need to be built on me, not on bread alone, right? Notice what Matthew chapter 4, oops, Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 says. This is, this kind of sums it up what Jesus is saying. Now, he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 5 in his first temptation in the wilderness. Page 1253, Jesus is, Jesus is, is being tempted by the devil to turn the stones into bread. He just fasted for 40 days. And Jesus answers him and says in verse 4, it is written, man shall not live on what? By bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We live because of Jesus being in our minds through his Holy Spirit. Man shall not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by the word of God. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen? Amen. Is he talking about literal flesh and blood no now let's think about this just for a second if we believe that we're talking literal flesh and blood how does that distort the picture of God it says it makes, it, it makes God look kind of gross number one but number two it takes, it takes this idea of Christ dwelling in us and it makes it some mystical union of physical substance rather than by the indwelling presence of God in our lives. Takes a relationship completely out of the union with Christ. There's no relationship. It's just, it's just an ingestion thing. Do you see the difference? One, one, shows, one shows God wants to actually dwell in, dwell in us. He wants to tabernacle with us because he loves us. The other one shows, oh, wow, that's kind of weird. You know, we can, we can eat God to make him be a part of us. Now, I, 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 don't mean to, I don't mean to sound crass or crude or anything like that, so if I, if I am, I apologize. Uh, I just, we just have to see that when, when we misunderstand a doctrine, it paints God in a very strange light. Do you see that the Bible clearly teaches the opposite? <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's keep going. Now, this is another doctrine that this one is, is believed by a lot of Protestants and and I want to just, I just want to consider it for a moment, the secret rapture. Now, uh, most Protestants today believe in a rapture. Rapture is just the coming of Christ. But the idea of it being secret or not, that's a question. I just want to ask the Bible, does the Bible, what does the Bible say about that? So what is the secret rapture? This doctrine says that Christ will secretly rapture his people before, now notice this word carefully, before the what? the time of trouble. Um, and those left behind receive a what chance? Second chance. Now, there are, I want to be really fair. There are variations on this theme. So there, there, there's not, um, you'll see slightly, you'll see different nuances. So I, I'm not going to all the different nuances on this doctrine. You, you, uh, those left behind receive a second chance to come to Christ. Let's continue on. So what does the Bible teaches. Well, how many, number one, resurrections are there? Let's go to John chapter 5. 
and, and read verses 28 and 29. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Now notice what it says. Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which how many? All who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done what? Good to the resurrection of life. And how do we do good? By who and through who? Jesus, right? Through the Holy Spirit working in us and through us alone. So he's not saying you can work your way to heaven here. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of what? Condemnation. Some translations say damnation. Um, the resurrection of life. There's two resurrections. A resurrection of life and a resurrection of condemnation or damnation. Okay? Well, let's keep that in mind. Let's continue on. What does the Bible ta tell us about the rapture that's coming? Are these resurrections... Now, this is a critical, this is a critical question to ask. Are these resurrections before or after the time of trouble? Let's go to the book of Daniel, and let's just check it out. Daniel chapter 12, and we'll start there on verse 1, which is on page 1135. Daniel 12 and verse 1. And it says, at that time, Michael shall stand up. Remember, there's the judgment going on. Michael stands up. The great prince who stands over the sons of your people, who stands watch over the sons of your people. And it says, after he stands up, there shall be a what? Time of trouble. Such as when? Such as what? Never was, since there was a nation. Even to that time. And it says, and at that what? Time, your people shall be delivered. So, so during this, in other words, the end of this time of trouble is the second coming of Christ. At this time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Notice what happens next. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to what? Everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. How many resurrections? There's, there's, there's the two categories once again. Life, contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever. So in other words... These resurrections are after the time of trouble. Or really, they're the ending of the time of trouble. They put an end to it. Jesus comes, the time of trouble is going on, boom. The time of trouble ends when Christ shows up. Okay? Let's keep going. How visible is Christ coming? Let's go to Matthew chapter 24, and let's look at verses 26 and... 27, page 1284. Now, Matthew chapter 24 is one of the key passages for the doctrine of the secret rapture. But let's notice what, Matthew, uh, what, what it says in Matthew 24. These, are, again, are the words of Jesus. Matthew 24 and verse 26. It says, Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not what? Go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. Now notice the description of the second coming of Christ. For as what? Lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west. So also will the coming of the what? Son of man be. Is that a visible event or a not visible event? That's pretty visible. Okay, let's read verse 30. Well, here, let's read verse 29 because this is kind of interesting. Immediately after the what? tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars uh, will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of what? The Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will what? How many, how many of the tribes? All. So they all are aware of this and they will what? See the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So how visible is this coming? Well, it's as the lightning flashes from the east to the west. All the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of glory. Okay. It's not going to be very secretive. 
if everybody knows about it. How loud is it going to be? And let's notice Matthew 24, verse 31. So as he comes, what happens? And he will send his angels with a great sound of a what? With a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from where? The four winds. From one end of heaven to the other. Okay. Let's continue on. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians 15. And let's see what the Apostle Paul writes there. Notice what the Apostle Paul writes in verses 51 and 52. Page 1512. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. The apostle writes, Behold, I tell you a what? A mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be... Hallelujah. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at when? The last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the who's going to be raised? The ra the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. In other words, it's talking about which resurrection? The resurrection of life or the resurrection of condemnation? Resurrection of life because they're being changed incorruptible. And he goes on to say, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. Aren't you excited about that? I'm excited about that. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah. I am looking forward to that day. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Let's go just a little bit farther forward to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, page 1571. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 13 through 16. Let's notice what we see. The Apostle Paul writes again, But I do not want you to be what? Ignorant, brethren. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. See, there, there was a belief in the Colossian church that, those, that, that you lived in this life only and there was no resurrection. It was this little thing that came in and discouraged the believers. And they're like, oh man, what's the point of all of this then? If this is it. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. Wait, don't, don't miss the point. If Jesus, if Jesus died... Notice verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of who? The Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no mean what? Precede those who are asleep. And then he says in verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a what? With a shout. With the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. So is this a quiet event or a loud event? It's a very loud event. We've got a great sound of a trumpet. Trumpet will sound. We hear it with a shout, the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God. This is the way it's described. It's a loud event. The whole world's going to hear it. There's going to be the dead are going to be rising. It's going to be incredibly exciting. I can't wait to meet my, some of my loved ones that have, that have died and and, and love the Lord and all these things. I'm so excited. So where will the resurrected righteous and the resurrected uh, and the righteous living meet Jesus? Well, it tells us in the very next verse, verse 17. It says, Then we who are alive and what? Remain shall be caught up, what? Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Hallelujah. So we get to go and be with Jesus forever. We meet the righteous, the righteous dead that have been resurrected. As they're being resurrected, we're all being swept up into the clouds to meet Jesus, the clouds of angels. How exciting. Notice what it says. Paul says right at the end, he says, Therefore what? Comfort one another with these words. Is there comfort in the, in the resurrection? Boy, is there comfort in the resurrection. Now check this out. Let's keep going. Where do the righteous go? This is really important. So we have all the righteous there in the clouds. Why are they there in the clouds? John 14 tells us where we're going. John 14 verses 1 through 3. He says, Let not your heart be what? Troubled. You believe also in God. Believe also in me. 
In my Father's house are many what? Mansions. Some translations say rooms. And then Jesus says, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a what? Place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Hallelujah. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Because who's the way? Jesus. We get to go to heaven. The righteous get resurrected. The righteous dead get resurrected. The righteous living get translated and, and transformed in the twinkling of an eye. And he takes us to heaven. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So what happens to the wicked living at the second coming? <laughs> I threw some vultures on there. What happens to there? Let's go to Revelation 19. And we're going to study the, we're going to study the thousand years and whatnot um, uh, to, uh, tomorrow. But what happens, what happens to the wicked living at the second coming? Verse 21, the last chapter of Revelation 19 says, and it says the rest were what? This is talking about the wicked were slain or killed with the what? The sword. Remember Jesus at the very, very, very first day we talked about the description of Jesus in Revelation 1. He, what did he have coming out of his mouth? The sword, right? And what did that sword represent? The word of God. So the, the wicked that are alive on earth, it says are killed by the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And then it says, all the what? The birds were filled with the flesh. Apparently the vultures, the vultures survive. Just a little bit. So they're killed. And the birds are filled with their flesh at the second coming of Christ. So how many people are left on earth then? Well, the righteous living, the righteous dead are going to Christ with Christ to heaven. This is right before the thousand years. The wicked have been slain, slain by, it says, by the sword of his mouth, the word of God. So there's nobody alive there on earth except for the devil and his little minions. So what does it mean when it says one will be taken? This is one of the one main passages that people quote. It's in Matthew and it's in Mark, but Luke gives us the most detail on this. These are all parallel passages. Luke chapter 17. Let's look at this one. And they say, well, wait a minute. The Bible says that the one will be taken and one will be left. One will be taken and one will be left. What does it mean when it says one will be taken? Let's look at Luke chapter 17 and verse 34. Now, I want you to notice there's a few italic words here. I wish they wouldn't have used the italic words because... <laughs> I think it would make more sense without them, but it's okay. Those, remember, those are the, the added words they're trying to figure out. Notice it says, I, will t I tell you, verse 34, Luke 17, verse 34. I tell you, in that night, there will be two, and it says men, but really it's just two, two in one bed, and one will be taken, and the other will be left. Two, and it says women this time, but it just says two in the Greek. Two will be grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. Two, and it says men this time, but again, it's just two. Two will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. The disciples are like, what is he talking about? Because he's, he's talking about the coming of the Lord here. It says, where are they taken? So verse 37, the Lord answered and said to them, and they answered and said to him, does to Jesus, where, Lord? And notice what he says. Where are the ones that are taken? Where are they taken to? So he said to them, wherever the body is, there the eagles. By the way, that word can also be translated vultures. <laughs> it parallels Revelation 19 perfectly. I don't want to be one of the taken. <laughs> that's, the, that's the wicked. <laughs> the wicked get taken and they get slain. It means they're going to be killed. When it says one will be taken... It means they're going to be killed. The ones that are left are the ones that get translated up, to, up, up into the clouds of glory. The ones that are killed are become the foods for the birds, where the eagles are, or the vultures. Some translations actually use the word vultures. Wherever the body is, there the, vulture, there the eagles will be gathered together. Interesting. 
So let's just ask a quick question. I want to be real sensitive, but I mean, I, I, I can't find in the Bible where there's a secret rapture. I see a rapture, but it's anything but secret. Now, what's the problem then? Where, what, what is the problem if, 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 if there is no secret rapture? What's the problem with believing in the secret rapture? Well, number one, how many people have you heard say, well, if it really is true, when the rapture happens, I'll get my act together. Have you heard of it? I've heard people say, have you ever heard someone say that? What if there's no second chance? That's a scary thought. When's the, when's the time of salvation? It's now. Today's the day of salvation. Uh, I, you know, there's going to be a lot of people in heaven, I believe, that believe this doctrine. I, so I'm not... But, but I think the problem with the doctrine is that it causes a lot of people to have a false sense of security. It says, well, if I don't, if I don't get it right, if, if, they're actually, if those others are actually right, yeah, I'll go through the... All, because the, the secret rapture teaches it's before the time of trouble. Well, I can't find that anywhere in Scripture either. And they say, well, I know I'm going to go through a time of trouble, but at least I get a chance to get my act together. Maybe I can be part of that great multitude or 144,000 that they talk about. But what if there's no second chance? A lot of people will be lost because they're looking for that they're banking on that second chance that isn't coming. What about baptism? Baptism is uh, another doctrine, the last doctrine we're going to look at tonight. We better wrap this up. We better go quick through this one. Baptism. How many different, what are some different examples of water baptism out there in the world today? There's a little picture of a baby being baptized. Well, we have infant baptism. We have sprinkling. Get sprinkled with a little bit of water. Pouring water over someone like this baby's getting. Baptism by immersion. Um, the, you know, our, our faith here, we practice baptism by immersion. I know the uh, Baptists, that's kind of where they got their name from, through baptism by immersion. Um, and then some people, which is a form of uh, baptism by immersion, but they call it the believer's baptism. Because they say, you need to actually know what you're being baptized into before you get baptized. What is the Greek word for baptize? There it is in Greek that, that says baptizo, or bap, some people will say it baptizo. Um, what does that Greek word literally mean? What does that Greek word literally mean? Well, the Greek word literally means to immerse. Notice what John 3 said. It's kind of an interesting statement. This is just a little, a little aside. In John 3 verse uh, 23... Uh, well, verse 22 says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there remained with them and baptized. There he remained with them and baptized. And it says, And John was baptizing where? In Anon near Salim. Why is he baptizing there? Because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. In other words, there's enough water to get the job done. Enough to water to get the job done because they're not going to be just doing this. They, don't need, they just need a trickle if it's this or a little cup to pour it if it's, if it's that the, the Greek word baptizo literally means to immerse now let's ask the question what are the Bible conditions for baptism Matthew 3 verses 5 and 6 Matthew 3 verses 5 and 6 by the way while you're turning there there's an interesting story um, about um uh, Menno Simons, the, the, the Mennonite church, the, um, all, the, all the Anabaptists, they kind of came out of his tradition. But one of the things that really kind of shook him up and caused him to really study the Bible, he, was, he watched Protestants martyring another Protestant because he had been rebaptized. And he's like, what in the world's going on? He watched him kill him for that. And, uh, and so th th this baptism thing is actually a kind of a big deal. Let's notice what Matthew says, 3, verse 5 and 6. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around Jordan went out to him, that's to John the Baptist, and were baptized by him in the Jordan. And what did they do? Confessing their sins. So we see, we see a, a, a confession of sins as a, as, a, as a requisite for baptism. What about Acts? 
What does Peter say on the day of Pentecost? Acts 2, verse 38. 2, verse 38. Peter says to them, Acts 2, verse 38, page 1423. Peter says to them what? What does he say? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the what? Remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's go one more passage here to Acts chapter 8, 36 to 38. uh, 38. uh, Philip, the deacon Philip has met with um, the Ethiopian eunuch and he teaches him about Jesus through Isaiah 53, the great prophecy. And it says there in verse 36, it says, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said to him, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your what? Heart, you may. And Jesus answered and said, I believe that Je-, And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Hallelujah. Whoops. So what are, our, what are our conditions? Well, we see a confession of sins, repentance. That means to literally to turn away. Be baptized in whose name? The name of Jesus Christ. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as it says in Matthew 28. And believe in Jesus with how much of our heart? All of our heart. Let's keep going. What should we ask for when we get baptized? Well, we saw that in Acts 2.38, for the sake of time, let's just, let's just remind ourselves. We saw in Acts 2.38, after they got baptized, Peter said, you will receive the gift of who? The Holy Spirit. Now, what, is it, what, is the same, what does the same Luke say in Luke chapter 11? Luke wrote Acts as well. What does he say in Luke 11, verse 13, on page 1349? Quoting the words of Jesus, he says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who what? To ask Him. So when we get baptized, we should be asking for God to fill us with His Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want anyone to go away thinking that a person, if they haven't been baptized, can't be filled with the Holy Spirit already. Remember Cornelius and his family in Acts. They were filled with the Holy Spirit before they had water baptism. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit's working all the time. Uh, is it ever appropriate to get rebaptized? Well, what does the Bible show us? What does the Bible tell us? Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. Let's, let's skip down to verse 3 to verse 3. Well, actually, we've got to read verse 2 at least. I might as well just read it all. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. They didn't even know that the Holy Spirit existed. And he said it to them, Into what then were you what? Baptized. So they said it, into John's baptism. In other words, the baptism of repentance. They they repented of their sins. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. Now notice what they did. When they heard this, they were what? Baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they get rebaptized. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Interesting. Is it ever appropriate to get rebaptized? Well, the, the scriptures demonstrate that it is. Now, what did Jesus give us as a symbol of recommitment? Um, some, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever come across friends or whatever that they make a mistake spiritually and they're like, oh, I gotta, I gotta get rebaptized. And a year later they say, oh, I gotta get rebaptized. And they're like trying to do four or five, six times or something like that. Did John, did, did Jesus give us a, a symbol of recommitment? Now there is a time, by the way, for recommitment um, in baptism. There is a, definitely a time and place for that. Uh, but did Jesus give us a, a, a recommitment for, as well? Notice what it says in John 13, verses 5 through 10. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. It then came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? 
Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not now understand, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have how much part with me? No part with me. I love, I love Peter. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my, also my hands and my head. It's like, I'm, I'm all in, Jesus. Do everything. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to what? Wash his feet. But is, is completely clean. You are, all, you are clean, but not all of you. He's, of course, referring to Judas in that case. So what's, what symbol did he give us? He gave us the foot washing service that we, that we see um, some churches today will do that at during the communion or, or the Lord's Supper. Um, they'll do the foot washing as well. We do that here. Foot washing. It's a symbol of recommitment to, G, to, to the Lord. So what is baptism by immersion a symbol of? Now this is really the most important thing. Why is immersion so important? Because it, it, it's a symbol for something very important. Notice what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 6. Romans 6, verse 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into what? His death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? Newness of life. So we're baptized into Christ's death and we're raised to walk in a new life in who? Christ. It's a symbol of that. It's just a symbol of those things, the experience that God wants us to have walking with Him. Now if I'm just being sprinkled, how, do I, how does that symbolize that? It doesn't really symbolize that at all. What do we become, what if, I, what if I'm baptized when I'm a baby? Have they made any choice for Jesus? Not even a little bit. What do we become a part of when we are baptized? Acts chapter 2, verses 41, 47. Notice this, this is really important. I've heard some people say, I want to be baptized, but I don't want to join the church. You ever heard anybody say that? I've heard a few people say that. I want to be baptized, but I don't want to join the church. Notice what it says. Then those who gladly received his word were what? Baptized the same day of Pentecost. And that day about, how many were baptized? 3,000 souls were added to them. Added to who? To the disciples. What do we call them? The church. They're added to the church. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The church. Let's go ahead and let, let's let's skip the First Corinthians passages. I encourage you to read those. They they hint at the same things. Um, there. We're baptized into Christ and in into the body of believers. Does Jesus want people to get baptized when they believe and accept Him? I mean, is this something that he actually asks us to do? Notice what it says in Matthew 28. Jesus, of course, says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in what? Heaven and on earth. And then he says to his disciples, Go therefore and make what? Disciples. Of how many nations? All nations. And then it says, baptizing them in the name of the, the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's read Mark chapter 16. Notice what it says there. Mark 16, 15 and 16. And he said to them, go into the all the world and preach the gospel to how many? To every creature. Verse 15, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Does Jesus want people to get baptized when they believe and accept him? Absolutely. Now, 
I want to just be real clear. Are we saved by the process of being dunked under the water and coming up out of the water? Because one could re- misunderstand what that passage just said in that way. And some people will preach that. If you aren't, this is why infant baptism came into the church. They're like, wait a minute, Jesus says if you're not baptized, you won't be saved. No, no, that's not what he's saying at all. What is he saying? He's saying, if you believe, what's the natural fruit you're going to do? Well, I'm going to obey Christ, right? And he says, if you believe, be, be baptized, be obedient. And so in response to our belief in Christ, that's why the great opposite of that, those that don't believe is, are those that are condemned. I'm not saying a person shouldn't get baptized. Don't read it that, that way either. Is it baptism that saves someone or is baptism a symbol of what Christ has done in the heart? It's a symbol, right? It's a symbol of Christ's death and resurrection in our life today. When is the day of salvation? We've quoted this already a little bit today. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Our last verse. Thanks for hanging with me tonight. For he says, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and the day of salvation I have helped you. And then Paul writes, Behold, now is the what? Accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It's now. Jesus calls us now. We should never, we should never take, take that for granted. Today is the day. Today is the day. Today is the day. I'm going to surrender to him today. So what have we learned today? What do we see from this? Well, number one, I understand that there are many false teachings in the world. And the Bible says the truth sets people free. When we understand things truly, when we see Jesus and how he does it, how, how, what he's actually teaching in his word, it sets people free. Sets them on the right path. If you see that, mark a little yes there. Well, I invite you to mark a little yes. A yes. Number two, I see that we need Christ in our lives through the Holy Spirit. Do you see that too? If you see that too, I invite you to write a little yes or a check mark there. Number three, when's the day of salvation? It's now. If the Holy Spirit has been working on our heart in some fashion, don't quench the Holy Spirit, right? Don't quench the Holy Spirit. When we quench the Holy Spirit, it gets, His voice gets a little harder to hear. And we say, no, Lord, I don't want to mess with that right now. How many people will, will be lost because they said, I'm going to put it off till later. Think of... Think of um, King Agrippa with Paul. <laughs> Almost you persuaded me to be a Christian. Number four, baptism is by immersion and is a symbol of a new life in Christ. If you see that too in Scripture, just mark a little yes. There's two responses tonight. I, I, you notice five and six. Both of them don't, res- both of them don't apply to you per- most likely. Well, they could apply to both of you. Uh, both of them could apply to you, but... Most likely, or perhaps only one does. If maybe you've never been baptized, and you're like, you know what? I see it, and I understand this. This is true. And when I say baptized, baptized by the biblical process of immersion. And you want to say, I want to commit my life to Jesus and join his church by baptism. You know, if that's where you're at, today's the day of salvation. Mark a little yes there. Come talk to me and I'll have a prayer with you. And, I'll, and we'll, we'll talk about the process of getting ready for that. And two, if you've already been baptized by immersion, Paul says, I die daily. Maybe number six is the one for you. I want to commit to follow Christ according to the teachings of the Bible rather than man. It's a recommitment, a daily recommitment. If one of those two or both of those apply to you, do you want to just raise your hand and say, yeah, this is what I want to do in my life today? That's what I want to do. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for your love and your grace to us. Thank you for your blessings and praise you for everything you've done. You are good and awesome God, Lord. 
You've given us your word, Lord, to challenge us, to shake us up, Lord, but to set us in the path of truth, Lord. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Your word is truth. Your spirit is truth. Your law is truth. And the truth sets us free. And we thank you for that, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would seal our commitments in our hearts tonight. In your name. All right, we have a drawing, one, one book tonight, and then we'll... <laughs> no, that's perfect. All right, let's see who we got tonight. All right, we got 2294864. Hey, okay, Rust, Rusty. There you go. Well, God bless you all, friends. Thanks for coming and uh, hanging with us. And I, uh, yeah, invite you to come join us tomorrow in the morning. And uh, if, if you'd like to, to hear those presentations, we'd love to have you come and join us. So God bless you all. Thanks for coming. <laughs>